My guest is no stranger to many of you. She's been on CNN, Fox News, Hannity and Combs. Uh, she's formerly a anchor woman of international news in Middle East television in the Arabic language. She was originally born uh, in uh, Lebanon and she is now a citizen of the United States and she says there is a parallel between the fate of Lebanon. There's such a similarity between Lebanon and the United States and that the United States is literally at a stage two cancer ready to have the full-blown cancer unless there is a change. And it is the most amazing supernatural parallel that I've asked Brigitte Gabriel. Um, Brigitte, uh, tell me a little bit about Lebanon uh, as you were a child. What was it like before it changed? Well, Lebanon used to be known as Paris of the Middle East and the banking capital of the Middle East. Many people don't realize today that Lebanon used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. Uh, we were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We had open border policy. We welcomed everyone into our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of of the Middle East. Education was very important to us as a part of our Judeo-Christian culture. You know, we focused on education and commerce. We had built the best universities in the Arabic world. Muslims used to send their children from the Arabic world to come to our universities to study, then graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy in the Arabic world, even though we did not have any oil. Sadly, all that began to change after but, 30, but 40 years. It is so amazing. You have just described the United States of America, how tolerant we are, how, how we welcome diversity, how we allow what's going on in mosques today in the United States uh, going on. It, I mean, it just, when I read your book, Because They Hate, I felt that everyone must read this because of the parallels uh, and, and recognize it, it's almost a preview of what is shortly going to happen to the United States of America. Well, what changed things in your country? Uh, this is exactly a preview of what's going to happen in the United States because what happened in my country was once the Muslims became a majority because of their birth rates and the way they multiply, even though we started as a majority, but we don't have many children. You know, Christians and Jews, and now we are seeing this throughout the Western world, including the United States. We're not multiplying enough. We have two, three children from the time our kids are born. We start thinking what college we're going to send them to. The Muslims multiply much faster. And in Lebanon, because there were a lot of them to begin with, they multiplied to become the majority. We always had the situation contained in Lebanon until the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan, when Yasser Arafat tried to overthrow the king and establish a base from which to fight Israel, kill the Jews and throw them into the sea. He failed to do so because of the dictatorship of the king. Jordan wasn't a democratic, open-minded, fair and tolerant society. We, Lebanon, were the only the Christian country in the Middle East, the only country to accept the third wave of Palestinian refugees into the country. They were majority Muslims. They put their heads together with the Muslims in Lebanon and declared holy war on the Christians. They used why, our... Why, 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 why a war on the Christians? Christians, uh, if you follow the teachings of Jesus, you're supposed to love and be tolerant. Uh, the Christians weren't causing them a problem. Why a war on the Christians? No. The Christians were not causing them a problem because, like you said, we Christians are taught to give, to love, to treat our neighbor the way we want to be treated. And this is how Lebanon operated as a democratic, mostly Judeo-Christian society. But what happened was uh, Islam is an intolerant religion. So when you have intolerant people coming into society that shows them tolerance, we literally tolerated intolerance and allowed intolerance to take us over. We judged our people, we reflected our standards, our Judeo-Christian standards standards of love, acceptance, tolerance, respect, multiculturalism, diversity, like you said, on people who did not value the same values we did, and they used our democracy, our open-mindedness, our fairness, and our tolerance against us to destroy our democracy. And I see the same signs happening in America today. We are seeing the God of tolerance in the United States, allowing intolerance of people who are not tolerating our 
Western system who are trying to force their own point of view on the rest of us, including the they do not agree with our freedom of speech, they do not agree with our freedom of religion, yet they're using our freedoms to get a foothold in our country. And, and, and what you indicate, they start out peace-loving. For instance, one of the things that upsets me a lot is there is a mantra in the press in the United States, Islam is a peace-loving religion. Is that true? No, this is a false statement. Islam is a violent religion. It is not a peaceful religion. The word Islam means submission. Salam means peace. But many times the Muslim lobby groups and the Muslim talking heads confuse the two together and they say, well, Salam, peace. It is not the same word. Salam means peace, but Islam means submission. Yeah, no, but, but, Islam but, but, itself. But, but, no, 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 but wait a second. In the Quran, I've heard, I've heard uh, imams on, on television say uh, it, the Quran talks about peace and they quote verses in the Quran. There are verses in the Quran that talk about peace. Those verses began when Muhammad was trying to appeal to the Jews to accept him as the last prophet. When Muhammad's own people rejected him in Mecca, he decided if he goes to Medina and appeals to the Jews to accept him, you know, he had to borrow some of their verses. And this is why we see in the early t uh, verses of the Quran, there's a lot of peaceful verses about the people of the book. This is when Muhammad was trying to recruit them. He went to Medina. When the Jews refused him, this is when he declared all the wars against them and against the infidel and this is when Muhammad became a military man so all the other verses all the following verses of the Quran are violent verses calling for the destructions of Jews and Christians tell, and in tell, Islam, me one, tell me one verse in the Quran that is uh, against Christians and Jews, well or what, Jews. what I'm gonna say the, the verses they are too numerous to count, thousands by the thousands, but especially, you know, Surah number nine is all about declaring war against the Christians and the Jews. But here's the interesting thing. In the Quran, in Islam, there is the law of taqiyya, which is kithman or lying, which I discuss in my book because they hate. Under the law of taqiyya, a Muslim is allowed to tell a lie, even knowing that it is true, uh, that, that he is telling a lie, but knowing that he is forgiven by the Quran. And here's why. Because under the law of taqiyya, and Nesikh and Mansukh, there is the law of abrogation of the Quran. If there are two verses contradicting each other, the latter verse is, wipes out the first verse and the latter verse becomes the truth. So the question I have, and the question I have to you is, how can you have a long-term peace with someone that says lying is okay? Don't go away, we'll be right back to find out how Islam is infiltrating our prisons and our universities. Be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Brigitte Gabriel. And uh, Brigitte, uh, you were born in Lebanon. Lebanon was known as the, the Paris of the Middle East. It was known for its tolerance and multiculturalism. Such parallels between Lebanon and the United States, but everything turned when Islam became the dominant religion. And you and your family had to literally live in a bomb shelter for how many years? Uh, seven years. And tell me about the time your mother was injured. Well, the war began in 1975 in Lebanon, and that's when my 911 happened to me. When our lives turned upside down, that's when the Muslims were attacking our town, trying to take us over. We woke up from a dream life into a nightmare. Uh, we ended up living in a bomb shelter for seven years of our lives, fighting for our existence. While the world was asleep and no one paid attention, it was Israel that came to aid the Christians of Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, up until 1975, considered Israel the enemy because they followed, they thought if they go along with the mostly Arabic religion surrounding us, Arabic states, mm -hmm. that that will bind them protection points, you know, brownie points with the Arabic countries. Little did we know how much they resented us, we as infidels. So when the war started and the Muslims started massacring the Christians, I lived in a little town in South Lebanon. Few people from my town went to Israel and begged for help. And Israel started coming in the middle of the night and helping the Christians and protecting the Christians. And this is how we survived. While the rest of the Christian world was asleep, it was the Jews who came and shed their blood to defend the Christians of Lebanon. 
And this is how we survived until about uh, 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon. And the only reason Israel invaded Lebanon was because Syria and Iran had gotten involved in the war. And at that time, we had 11 Muslim terrorist organizations operating out of Lebanon, trying to overthrow Lebanese democracy, grab a hold of the country, and create a base from which to attack Israel. So Israel started working with the Christians, trying to take back, help the Christians take back their democracy, get restrengthened. Um, Israel invaded Lebanon, and during that invasion, the Muslims were shelling us frantically as they were retrieving. My mother became wounded, and we had to take her to an Israeli hospital for treatment. For my mother, it was a life-saving experience. But for me, it was a life-changing experience. In what way? That was the first time I was in Israel by myself, uh, my mother unconscious, going from one surgery to another in the hospital, where I was able to see the Jewish people, the way they were treating and reacting to the Lebanese wounded and even their enemy. My mother was wounded and we had to take her to an Israeli treatment, to Israeli hospital. And I ended up spending 22 days in that hospital. What I saw was amazing. I saw Israeli doctors treating Lebanese wounded people in the emergency room, treating terrorists brought in from Lebanon, Muslims, Palestinians. They didn't see um, religion. They didn't see aff uh, religious affiliation or nationality. They, 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 I mean, if they had an Israeli wounded and a uh, Palestinian wounded, if the Palestinian, you say in your book, if the Palestinian was in worse shape, they would take the Palestinian over the Israeli? Absolutely. What would have happened, in your, what would have happened in your country if it was reversed? Oh, first of all, if a Jew made it even to the hospital, he would be lynched and thrown to his death and butchered as screams of joy will echo through the hospital and down the surrounding streets. Shouts of Allahu Akbar would echo because they killed an infidel, a filthy Jew. I experienced the human quality in Israel that I knew for a fact my culture will not be able to show their enemy in their most trying moments the way the Jews did. I realized that the Arabic world feeds its population fabricated lies about the Jews that is so far from reality. I was in the hospital um, for 22 days, and during those days, people would come, Jews came from all over Israel knowing that they were Lebanese wounded in the hospital, bringing baklava and bringing foods and bringing chocolates and telling the Lebanese, how can we help you? What can we do for you? Our homes are your homes. Just let us know how we can serve you. Um, it was an unbelievable scene. Uh, one of the ladies with my mother who was wounded from Lebanon, she was a Muslim. She was in the hospital for 10 days, and the Jews had saved her lives. And after the doctors would do their roundup, and even one day after 10 days she's been in the hospital, after they checked on her and they left, she looked at them and she would say, I hate you all, I wish you were all dead. And the first time in my life I experienced evil. I saw evil. Because when you are unable to be grateful for those who saved your life, you have no soul. And Muslims are raised from their mother's milk to hate the Jews. They are raised not only because of their culture teaches them to hate the Jews, but also the Quran itself, the, the holy books that they read, the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah. Muhammad specifically, even in his dying bed, his last words, was urging his followers to fight the Jews until the end. But, but wait a second. I know as a fact that there are Muslims that are menches, that's a Hebrew word, are good people, that uh, there are Muslims like that, uh, so we're talking about just a fringe group, or are we talking about someone that really follows the Quran, does what the things you're saying? Well, there are millions of moderate Muslims in the world. There are millions of wonderful souls who do not want to kill anybody, right. who want to live their lives just like you and me, who want to raise their children, educate their children. They want their women to work. Those are the wonderful people that we are not talking about. We are talking about the radicals right now who are the devout Muslims, the good Muslims. What we call today as radicals are not some, those who hijack the religion. The radicals are following the religions by the word and following the footsteps so of the Prophet Muhammad. You're saying to me that if someone does, if someone's a Muslim and doesn't follow the Quran, they can be moderate and they can be good people. Absolutely. However, if they follow the Quran, they may smile when they're in the minority, but when they're in the majority, we're in big trouble. You know, we didn't get to what's going on in the infiltration of the universities and the prisons. Don't go away, we'll get to that in the next segment. Be right back. We'll be right back.
to It's Supernatural! We now return to It's Supernatural! Hello, Sid Roth here with Brigitte Gabriel, and I am so excited to find out this information. It's so amazing to me. Brigitte, uh, you were telling me that in our American universities, they're being infiltrated. Tell me how. Uh, we are being infiltrated big time on our universities by Saudi Arabia and Gulf Sheikh sending in millions of dollars and buying influence in our universities. And our universities are just lapping up those funds. What's been happening is Saudi Arabia has been able to exploit a program called the Title VI program that was instituted by our government after World War II to teach American students about foreign languages and foreign cultures so they may be an asset to our country. But with the oil wealth coming out of the Middle East, the Saudis wanting to spread their radical ideology, have been funding, sending millions to universities, setting up Middle East departments and political science departments, and appointing professors, giving them tenure, who hate America, hate Israel, and are literally brainwashing our children. And the extent of Saudi peddling is incredible. Um, they are giving money by the millions, Harvard University, $20 million, Georgetown University, $22 million, and actually, since my book was was written and I discussed the 20 million to Georgetown they just gave another 20 some million dollars just mm. this month to Georgetown so you are seeing the influx of the money and it's is, not is, only is, is that the reason that universities like Columbia and Harvard uh, have such known radicals speaking there Absolutely. When they receive millions of funds coming from uh, shady sources in the Middle East, uh, they are just wanting to keep the peace and wanting to keep that money coming, uh, coming over. And when you have Saudis sending their children and you have Muslim countries sending their children paying top dollar tuitions to Columbia, to Harvard, to all the universities across the nation. And by the way, this is not a problem on the Ivy League schools. This is a problem from the community colleges all the way up to the Ivy League. So what we are seeing now is a new generation of Americans who think that we are the problem, America is the source of the problems in the world, Israel is the source of the problem, and the rest of the world is oppressed because of our success and our wealth. It's amazing. Be, you know, be, people but, in America but, but, work. But here's what doesn't make sense to me. Let's take Harvard University that has all these millions coming from uh, radical Islam uh, to build buildings and centers and endowments and things like that. Uh, they have so many Jewish students, so many prominent uh, Jewish graduates. Why do these Jewish graduates allow uh, these radicals to speak at that university? In the name of intolerance, in the name of bending the other way. They overcompensate because they are Jews. That's the problem we are seeing because it is Jewish attorneys who go and fight for these Muslims to have the rights. For example, Harvard just instituted uh, a month ago gym hours just for Muslim students, where if you and I have a son and we are paying $50,000 a year for our son to go to Harvard and in his tuition, it's included that he can use the gym. He's not allowed to use the gym certain days because it's only a loaded times for the Muslims. We are seeing segregation on our college campuses that's not now limited to the student housing where Muslim women want to pray by themselves in a little group in their dorms. They are now enforcing the segregation on the facilities that is used by the larger student body. Mosque in America. Now, I understand stand in London, there are more mosques than churches for the first time in history. Uh, in the United States, we're having, we have many, many mosques. What's going on in these mosques? What's so concerning about these mosques is the hate literature that has been found in these mosques. We all know that Saudi Arabia supports and finances 90% of the mosques throughout the world, so that goes the same well in the United States. And an undercover study, which I discuss in my book done by Freedom House, where they went undercover into some of the most prominent mosques and Islamic institutions in the United States, and they collected books in Arabic provided by the government of Saudi Arabia that teach Muslims living in America, how to deal with infidels living in infidel land. And in all these books of publications, they exhort Muslims to hate, hate them for their religion, meaning us, Christians and Jews, to hate for Allah's sake, 
to oppose them in every way, uh, maintain a wall of resentment against them. So while we're teaching love, they're teaching hatred. They say that democracy is responsible for all the horrible wars of the 20th century, and that attractive names like democracy, justice, freedom, and brotherhood. La last question, cell groups in America. Are there many? Yeah. There are many cell groups in the United States. Islamic uh, cell Hamas, groups. Uh, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, they are all up and operating in the United States. Hamas, which people think is an Israeli problem. Hamas has cells in over 40 states in the United States. Mm. Hezbollah, which people think is a Lebanese problem. Hezbollah has 11 cells on American soil. Islamic Jihad, Samuel Aryan, who was a professor at the University of Florida, who was convicted now and expelled out of the country, was the head of Islamic Jihad in the United States, raising millions of dollars to fund Palestinian suicide bombers to go into Israel and commit suicide bombing. This is the extent of the infiltration into our society. My book, Because They Hate, details such information. I'm giving you just the tip of the iceberg. When you read what is happening in our country, you realize why we not only need to pray for God to protect our country, we also need to get involved, become active, become patriotic, vigilant Americans, and, watching and our you communities. you know what is even more important? With everything happening in the world today, if you do not have intimacy with God, I'm going to read one Psalm of David, Psalm 91, that has a promise of protection for every evil that will come against you. This is for you right now. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Boy, that sounds good. Say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is your refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In your hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion, the cobra, the young lion, and the serpent. You shall trample them under your feet, because he has set his love upon you. Therefore, he shall deliver you. He will set you on high because you have known his name. You shall call upon him and he will answer you. He will be with you in trouble. He will deliver you. He will honor you. With long life, he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. Why? Because you have known his name because you have known him. It's not religion, it's not tradition, it's knowing God, intimacy with God. Without intimacy with God, what you've just heard, you have reason to fear, but there is no fear when you are so entwined with God by believing in the name of Jesus that he's washed away your sins and making him your Lord and asking him to live inside of you. 91 Psalm is yours.